Hello and welcome to A Bit Too Much to Think, live on KUST Radio. Amazing show for you today. We've got some classic rock, our returning news correspondent, Allage Zones, by popular request, and opinions and ideas that you most likely will not like at all. So I'm going to start this one off with uh, an interesting uh, interesting idea that uh, is from a long time ago. It's from a Supreme Court case called Reynolds v. U.S., Reynolds versus the United States. It is a case from 1879, uh, so just a little older than uh, your average person. But I do want to talk about it because I think it applies even today, kind of the ideas that were behind the the decision. Uh, and I actually uh, discussed this uh, in class, uh, so it's always cool to have the opportunity to discuss something that you learn in class because... Let's be honest, how much of what we learn in class do we actually use? I would say maybe 1% of it. Uh, and that's including, like, addition when you're buying stuff. So, uh, yeah, let's dive right into it. So, Reynolds v. U.S. is a 1879 case where a guy who is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormon Church, uh, he wanted to marry a second woman uh, when he was already married. And he argued that, as part of his faith, he should be allowed to. And uh, it's it's relevant to say, I think, at least that now, uh, the Mormon Church, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is way too long, uh, they do not currently allow uh, polygamy. They, they don't condone it, uh, which is very, very uh, prevalent, I think, uh, to consider now. But at the time, uh, they did. So... Uh, the decision was that it couldn't be allowed, and the reason for it is the 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 decision was actually it cited uh, a a writing by Thomas Jefferson that talked about so Jefferson was a I believe Jefferson was a deist is his official term, uh, and basically he didn't believe that uh, he he really didn't believe that Jesus was God's son. Um, he believed that. Jesus was a really great guy who you could learn a lot from, uh, who had some great stuff on being a, a good person. But he basically believed, he essentially you could say he was an agnostic. Um, you know, I, I think he, maybe a step up from agnostic, he, he did believe that there was a higher power, which is important to note. But uh, I don't think he really believed in the ideas of, you know, Jesus and living one's life for Christ completely. Um, which is interesting because you think of most founding fathers as these like religious nuts, right? But really, a lot of them were not very religious at all. And actually, uh, <laughs> Benjamin Franklin at one of the, I want to say it was a conference to write the Constitution, uh, he suggested that they start with a prayer, and every single person <laughs> unanimously said no uh, because they wanted to keep uh, government and church separate, which is really important. Uh, and that's actually kind of what this this case involves. So... That was a tangent, but uh, the decision um, cited Thomas Jefferson, who talked about this idea of belief versus action in a religious relationship with God. And so what they basically said is you can believe whatever you want, and you can believe that your religion allows you to do whatever you want or necessitates that you do whatever you want. You can believe that. You have every right to because government can't legislate opinion. I mean, they, they just can't, not in a, a society with, with freedom of speech. But uh, going along with that means that uh, if something that you believe and put into action affects another person or affects, uh, I believe, in this decision they talked about good social order, things like that, um, going against the law or the common law, uh you you can't do it. And I think that's an important distinction, and I think that it kind of bleeds into a free speech kind of idea. So, yeah, so this case, Reynolds v. U.S., uh, they basically told the Mormon guy, you can't marry another woman because it goes against good social order. You're allowed to believe that polygamy is, is, accept is acceptable. Uh, you're allowed to believe that it's part of your, of your faith. But you can't marry another woman. Now, 
from my understanding of marriage, which is absolutely none and purely anecdotal from other people talking about it, uh, this guy dodged a bullet having two wives. But uh, <laughs> talking in a more serious note, um, I it's probably going to be like those... Uh, what, I don't know. There's probably a TLC show about it. Uh, about yeah, sister wives. That's the show. Yeah, so that exists. Uh, they're only legally married to one person though. Uh, but they do. There are sister wives out there. So I'm sure he did that with uh, with this other woman. But anyway, um, so kind of the idea of belief versus action, and this is something that I think that more recently has come up in the political discussion of trying to think of the right way to phrase this basically thought policing this idea that you can't think anything that deviates from the norm or that you shouldn't so even if you know i might think that uh you know people who like soccer don't belong in my country i might think that they're terrible people uh, and i don't i don't really believe i mean i think soccer is stupid but uh you have every right to play it if you want to. But the point is, like, a, a person can really believe that another person is bad or doesn't belong in the country or something like that, but they can't act on it. And I think that's a really important distinction to make because you can't... I, I think recently, especially with things like... with groups like Antifa, you know, there's there's been these groups where it's like, oh, you know, these people have, have terrible opinions. Uh, let's, let's go punch them. And you can believe that it's right to punch people with different opinions than you. You have every right to believe that, but you can't act on it. And that's something that Antifa fails to, fails on constantly. And that's the reason why it's basically viewed as a terrorist organization. And it's not even just Antifa. I mean, you can believe that you know, Sarah Huckabee Sanders is a terrible person, but to then shout her out of a restaurant is disgusting. It, it's it's not it's not within the civility that has founded this country. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. I disagree with a lot of people. Uh, Louis Farrakhan, he's a he's a preacher uh, that is known to be friends with a lot of people in politics, you know, major, major individuals, you know, he's had lunch with President Obama. Um, he believes that the Jews are at the source of everything wrong with the world. He and Alex Jones have that in common. Uh, no, I actually don't know if, if Alex Jones believes that. But no, he, he really believes that, that Jews are terrible people. And he, he preaches this. He's a preacher. He has a church. He preaches that the, the Jews are going to destroy the country. It's a ridiculous notion, but he has every right to believe it, but he can't act on that. We we saw what happens in the 1940s in Germany when you act on that kind of belief, and it didn't go very well for anyone, really. So yeah, that that's kind of a, a thing that I think is important to take into note, is you can believe anything you want, but you can't act on it. And it, it's it's a bit of a, a bitter pill to swallow, the idea of you can believe what you want. Because that allows people to believe, you know, anti-Semitic beliefs. That allows people to believe racist, sexist, homophobic, bigoted, whatever, whatever ism or phobia you want to throw out there that you don't like. Every single person has the right to believe it. And that doesn't feel good because you don't like thinking that there's people out there that that hate someone based on their race or their religious belief or their sexual orientation because you don't like that idea. But in a free society, you have to allow those people to believe it. Otherwise, it's the thought police in 1984. And that that does not sound good. And the more that you hear about arrests for online statements uh, in the UK right now, they're, they're averaging, I, I want to say it was something like, it was either 300 over the past year, which is frightening, or it was 3,000 over the past year, which is even worse. Uh, the number of arrests for comments that people made online, and not like direct threats, saying things like, 
I think that the police are st- overstepping their bounds. And they get arrested for it. So, that, you know, y- you really can't have a thought police. And you don't like thinking that there's bad people in your country, especially not in your local community. But there are. And they have every right to believe those really terrible beliefs. That's a part of, of freedom of speech. The government can't prevent you from... And, and speech and belief are a little bit different because speech that directly calls for violence is against the law because you can't say, hey, go kill that guy, and then when people go kill that guy, you, that, that's against the law. But you're allowed to state your beliefs. You're allowed to say really, really shitty things like... The Jews will get what's coming to them, just like our uh, student body president here at UST tweeted when he was a freshman here. He tweeted, the Jews will get what's coming to them. And he was allowed to stay on as USG president because St. Thomas did nothing and USG hid the fact that they were voting to see if he was allowed to stay on. They didn't announce it at all. Yeah, did you forget that? Because I sure didn't. But he has every right to say shitty things like that. He has every right to believe shitty things like that. Sorry, I'm not supposed to say that. Crappy things like that. <laughs> he has every right to believe crappy things like that and say crappy things like that. But he's not allowed to act on them. Again, it really doesn't feel good. But it's true. And I think it's important to take into note. Because freedom isn't easy. It's not simple. It isn't always isn't the easiest pill to swallow but it's the best one because otherwise every single thought that you have could be analyzed every single idea that you could have could be analyzed and you end up in a 1984 police state which is really dangerous I don't think anyone really wants that at all so that's a lesson that we can learn from Back in the 1800s, 1879. So once again, to recap, it's uh, Reynolds v. U.S. You should look into it. It's actually a very interesting case. Uh, One of the earlier ones on the separation of church and state. It's pretty cool. Uh, And yeah, it's just a cool one. Uh, Them citing Thomas Jefferson is really interesting. Uh, I can't remember exactly what the note was. uh, But look that up for yourself. It's a good read. Because it's an interesting opinion. And the main takeaway is, not only can the court not prevent you from believing stuff, you can't legislate people away from believing in stuff. People are allowed to believe whatever they want, and within limits, they're allowed to say whatever they want. That's a part of being free. It does not always feel good, unlike uh, that song we just listened to. But... It is what it is, man. You know, you, you got to take the good with the bad. And if it's between someone insulting Jews and me not being able to say things that I believe, I'm going to take the asshole, sorry, the butthole <laughs> insulting Jews as much as possible. All right, so enough of the the deeper, boring talk. Let's get right into some music. Uh, This one goes out to the love of my life because she is my American girl. Hi, this is Sam with a bit too much to think. Unfortunately, due to copyright reasons, we cannot upload the music to YouTube. So if you'd like to listen to it and get the full experience, listen to us live 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. on Fridays on Radio KUST on MixLR. That's MixLR.com slash KUST dash radio. Thanks for listening. All right, that was American Girl by Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. So the next uh, part of the show that I want to go into is going to be about two new laws that Donald Trump just signed into into law uh, that no one is talking about for reasons that are, I think, rather uh, probably pretty... Hmm, what's the right word? probably pretty purposeful for why they're not talking about them because they're actually really good laws and no one in the media likes to talk positively about Donald Trump which I think is 
dishonest at best and malicious at worst. So uh, I'm going to talk about them because no one else is, and all three of you people listening are going to hear about them. So the first one, uh, and you can look these up on at congress.gov. Uh, they have all the new acts. Uh, this, the first one is called the Know the Lowest Price Act of 2018. Uh, so this one, and both these bills basically do the same thing, uh, which is actually very good for health care. But uh, it says here, and I'm reading it directly from congress.gov, uh, this bill prohibits a prescription drug plan under Medicare or Medicare Advantage from restricting a pharmacy from informing an enrollee of any difference between the price co-payment or co-insurance of a drug under the plan and a lower price of the drug without health insurance coverage. Such restrictions are commonly referred to as gag clauses. So what does this actually do? And the other law, uh, well, I'll go into what the, what are, well, actually I should probably talk about the other law because it does the exact same thing. Uh, it's the Patient Right to Know Drug Prices Act. Uh, and this is directly from congress.gov again. In general, a group health plan or health insurance issuer offering group or individual health insurance coverage shall not, not restrict directly or indirectly any pharmacy that dispenses a prescription drug to an enrollee in the plan or coverage from informing or penalize such pharmacy for informing an enrollee of any differential between the enrollee's out-of-pocket cost under the plan or coverage with respect to acquisition of the drug and the amount an individual would pay for acquisition of the drug without any health plan or health insurance coverage. So these both do the exact same thing. One of them does it for Medicare. The other does, does it for private insurance. But here's what they do. So it used to be that health insurance companies that didn't want... They, they basically could tell pharmacists, you cannot tell the customer if a drug would actually be cheaper or what the difference really is for what we are paying for their drug and uh, how much they'd be paying for it if they just did it out of pocket. Okay, so that's basically all it is. It, it, it prevents insurance companies from telling pharmacists you can't give this specific information to the customer. Now, here's why. I, I think this is why it's been enacted. I could be completely wrong. Hope I'm at least vaguely right. I don't know. Don't we all? Uh, but this is what the, the... Basically, I think the concept is if a person is paying for insurance and the insurance is basically covering none of this one prescription that they need or if the pharmacy is offering the prescription for cheaper if you pay out of pocket as opposed to using insurance... Or, you know, it would be, you know, somewhat cheaper or something like that. Then the pharmacist can't be prevented from telling this person. Now, why is this important? Because in healthcare, the reason that prices are so high is because there's no set price for anything. I mean, really, like, if you were to go into a doctor's office and you were to say, Hi, I need an appendix, I need to take get my appendix taken out. How much is that going to cost me? They'll be like, uh, I don't know. What's your insurance? And it's like, no, what if what if I pay out of pocket? I don't know. They have no idea. They don't have set prices. There are no set prices. There's like some restrictions on pricing, but they have no idea how much it's going to cost. And this is true of if you're going to get a procedure done or if you're going to go get a pill or something. It, there it is super unclear as to what the prices are. And a lot of people don't realize that when the hospital gives you the bill, if you're going to pay out of pocket, you can negotiate with them. Seriously, if they give you a bill for $20,000, you can say, I could pay 5000 right now, and then if you'll take that. And you, you can literally negotiate the pricing of what you'll pay with them. No one realizes this, but you can. You don't have to pay what they tell you. Now, the reason this came about is because Insurance companies would haggle with the hospitals and with the, with the pharmacies and pharmaceutical companies for how much they would pay. So there was never set pricing on it. Now, you know, you could say, well, that means we need set pricing legislation. I think that's wrong because there's going to be certain quality factors. There's going to be 
local and state regulation factors, there's going to be a lot that's going to affect the pricing. And if, you know, say you set the pricing for an appendicitis or appendicitis appendectomy uh, at, you know, $900, it can't go above $900, but state regulations would mean that they cost more than $900 for the procedure to be done. Well, then no doctor is going to be doing uh, appendicitis, uh, appendectomies anymore. So you don't want to do that. But uh, this this legislation, kind of getting back to it, is important because uh, the customer needs to know. Like, if you're paying for your own health care, you should know. And if you're paying for, if your insurance is helping cover your health care, you should know how much they're actually helping you. And if you can get it for even cheaper, you should know whether or not you can get it for cheaper. I mean, you really should be able to. I don't think that's a controversial thing at all. Uh, so I'm sure there's some people out there that are very upset with Donald Trump for anything he does, um, which there are. It's called Trump derangement syndrome. Look it up. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of people out there that could really be benefited from having more information available. And I'll give you one more scenario that I think is helpful for understanding the importance of this. So say you're paying $10 a month for health insurance. No one does, but let's pretend. Just for the sake, we'll use easy numbers, $10. And your prescription, you it's a monthly prescription, whether it's birth control or it's you know heart medicine or insulin or whatever it is. It's just some kind of medicine. Uh, that costs you $15 a month. That that's like your copay. So you go to the pharmacy, you give them your insurance, you know, they give you the prescription and you pay 15 bucks for it. Now, it's absolutely possible and I would argue likely that the insurance company may be paying less than $10 into the cost of the prescription. So what does that mean? That means with insurance plus prescription you are paying $25, right? But if the insurance company is only paying $8 into that prescription, it would be cheaper for you to not have that as part of your insurance coverage, which is an option, depending on what insurance you get. You can have those options. And you can decrease it based on your use, but what that's, that's kind of an aside. Uh, but uh, you can actually say to the, say to the pharmacist, I'm going to pay for this out of pocket, and then it can be a lot cheaper. Or, again, this will happen where pharmacies will do it where if you pay out of pocket, it'll be cheaper than if you, uh, if they have to deal with their health insurance company. Because health insurance, okay, it's so bad in this country, especially Medicare and Medicaid, but uh, they are th notorious for never paying people back. Ever. I mean, literally, like, doctors won't see Medicare or Medicaid money for, like, months after the procedure. So it can it can be really bad. And so often they will offer uh you know prescriptions for cheaper if you pay out of pocket right now or something like that. It, it's a system similar to that. It might not be exactly that. So that's the point of these legislations. And I think it's really important. I think they're very valuable and I think you have to look at them objectively. Because there's a lot of people that hate everything that Donald Trump does, but this is good. This is objectively good unless you work for an insurance company and are super greedy and all you care about is lining your the CEO's pockets. I don't know if a CEO actually runs a health insurance company, just whoever's in charge of it. So, there you have it. Those are two laws that were signed in. Don't have Trump derangement syndrome and just assume that they're bad. Uh, look at them objectively and see if you like them. I think they're very, very good for the reasons that I've outlined. So the next one that I'm going to be talking about before the next song break is going to be uh, a study done by the EU, by the European Union. Uh, so the European Commission has commissioned, I don't know how to pronounce it, e -Cories. It's spelled E-C-O-R-Y-S. To carry out a study on the relation between op online copyright infringement, a.k.a. digital piracy, and sales of copyrighted content. Hmm, very interesting. 
Why is that? Because the EU just signed into a law. Uh, there were a lot of memes about this law. Uh, it was called the meme killer law in colloquial terms, but basically it said that you cannot use any copyrighted material at all. There is, basically, it eliminates free use, and it would eliminate memes because anyone that owns the picture that a meme is on could force you to take it down and or sue you in, in Europe. Like, someone from Europe can't sue me in America because 1776, July 4th. Look it up. Uh, but that's the best day in history. But uh, <laughs> uh, anti-European sentiments aside, uh, it's a very interesting idea because we always hear, you know, uh, piracy is not a victimless crime. You always see that in front of movies and stuff like that. And, you know, you, you have people trying to police piracy constantly. You have ISPs trying to police piracy. And... There's always been a debate about whether or not piracy actually affects sales. So, this study, and it's just one study, so that doesn't mean it's conclusive, but the EU is basically trying to hide this study, so it's important to take into account. So it says, This study uses 2014 data and covers four types of creative content. Music, audiovisual material, so like uh, TV and movies, Books and games. Uh, contrary to other, contrary, wow, well, contrary to many other other studies, live attendances of music and cinema visits are included in the analysis. Again, interesting, good, thorough. The countries included in the analysis are Germany, the United Kingdom, Spain, France, Poland, and Sweden. These countries were selected because based on national sociocultural characteristics, they are as a group representative for the EU as a whole. All right. So let's look at their main conclusions. So I'm, I'm reading this directly from the document that came out. You can look it up. I'm trying to remember specifically where I got it. Just look up like, uh, what's the name of the study? Uh, so the name of the study is Estimating Dipla Displacement Rates of Copyrighted Content in the EU. Look that up. You'll, you can find a PDF for free. I guarantee it. So here's the main conclusion. In 2014, on average, 51% of the adults and 72% of the minors in the EU have illegally downloaded or streamed any form of creative content with higher piracy rates in Poland and Spain than any of the other four countries of the study than in the other four countries of the study. I don't know why those two have the highest piracy rates. Probably something to do with... I don't know, having good food in different languages. I don't, I don't know if I can know. Anyway, uh, so it says, this is word for word, I'm reading this off the document. In general, the results do not show robust statistical evidence of displacement of sales by online copyright infringements. That's right. You stealing is not actually stealing. According to this study, piracy is a victimless crime and people have been lying to us. So that's cool. Uh... It does go on to say this does not necessarily mean that piracy has no effect, but only that the statistical analysis does not prove with sufficient reliability that there is an effect. An exception is the displacement of recent top films. So if you're watching cams of films, uh, then most likely you're not going to be going to the theater, and that takes money away. Uh, so that's the only exception. Uh, so it, it, it goes on to say... Uh, the results show a displacement rate of 40%, which means that for every 10 recent top films watched illegally, four fewer films are consumed legally. People do not watch many recent top films a second time, but if it happens, displacement is lower. Two legal consumptions are displaced by every 10 illegal second views. This suggests that the displacement rate for older films is lower than the 40% for recent top films. All in all, the estimated loss for recent top films is 5% of current sales volume. So even in the only case where they could prove that there was that piracy had an effect, it was 5% of sales. Now, I know what you're saying. That's a lot of money because movies make a lot of money. And they cost a lot of money to make. Yes. But it's only 5%. So... No, look, I, I hate watching cams, like, when I download it. And by cams, I mean, like, where people bring camcorders into, probably don't, they'd probably just use their phones now, but when they bring them into theaters and then they, they film it and you just hope that, like, you see the full screen and that you don't hear a kid crying halfway through. 
Though, to be honest, that's the experience with most normal theaters anyway, so I don't really know how much of a difference there is. Really puts you in the place. Really gives you the full experience. But no, uh, so really what it's what it's talking about is, uh, and it, it kind of goes on to say that uh, the study also analyzed consumers' willingness to pay for illegally accessed creative content in order to assess whether piracy might be related to price levels. To optimize the rec- recollection of the respondent, sorry, recollection of the respondent, it was asked for the last illegal online transaction. Consumers, ooh, excuse me, hiccup. Consumers may be willing to pay more or less for other transactions, so the results should be interpreted with caution. Overall, the analysis indicates that for films and TV series, current prices are higher than 80% of the illegal downloaders and streamers are willing to pay. The prices are higher than 80%. For books, music, and games, prices are at a level broadly corresponding to the willingness to pay of illegal downloaders and streamers. This suggests that a decrease in the price level would not have changed piracy rates for books, music, and games, but that prices can have an effect on displacement rates for films and TV series. So what you're telling me is that when people price things too high, and there's an easy way around it to get the product... They will use the easy way around it instead of, I don't know, contributing to way too high prices. I don't know. I think the study really <laughs> confirms a lot of what I certainly have personally believed, but I think it disproves a lot of things that people have been talking about, which is to say that a lot of people are saying, you know, piracy is not a victimless crime. BS. This study shows that you're wrong. Now, I'm sure you could say, oh, well, you know, it takes some money. Okay, it 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 takes a cup of coffee away from Ed Sheeran. Yeah, I don't think that's going to be the end of the world to him. Yeah, I, I think it's, I, I, I like this study. Uh, obviously, you have to look at more studies that prove otherwise. You have to look at every study that tries to replicate the results. But the EU is trying to hide this study as much as possible so that you don't actually know that piracy is basically a victimless crime. Now, the reason that they, you know, going back to that meme killer legislation, that's the whole reason they had this study done in the first place is because they didn't want people to, uh, they, you know, they, they were trying to justify that awful piece of legislation, one that's truly terrible. I mean, it's just awful if you read it. It's not good legislation. That's not, that's not even by American standards. It's by European standards, which their legislation is like half of American freedom legislation. But anyway, so that's an interesting food for thought. Think about that one. Piracy might not be as bad as you think. Now, for the record, I, I feel like I have to say this. I'm not condoning piracy. I'm just saying think about it. All right. And while you're legally downloading some movies or something and waiting for them, Uh, Go ahead and, as this next song says, have a drink on me by ACDC. Hi, this is Sam with a bit too much to think. Unfortunately, due to copyright reasons, we cannot upload the music to YouTube. So if you'd like to listen to it and get the full experience, listen to us live 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. on Fridays on Radio KUST on MixLR. That's MixLR.com slash KUST dash radio. Thanks for listening. All right. Welcome back to A Bit Too Much to Think, live on KUST Radio. That was Have a Drink on Me by ACDC from my absolute favorite album of all time, Back in Black. Truly, I I think it is probably the greatest album of all time. And uh, don't at me because it's just true. You know, we all know it. In the words of Trump, you know it. I know it. We all know it. All right. So, uh, enough with Donald Trump. We are actually going to be talking to our news correspondent, Mr. Alej Zones. That is A-L-E-J space X-O-N-E-S. And I believe we have him live right now in the air. Uh, Mr. Zones, how's it going? Well, hey, Sam. It's going pretty good. How's it going for you? Oh, I, you know, I, I can't complain. Uh, so uh, I understand that you have some some really important things to discuss today. Yeah, yep, yeah, that's right. I uh I want to talk about something that's very important to me. Cause look, I was I was watching 
TV with my kids, and I just I put on Sesame Street. All right. Yeah, I I used to watch that myself. It's it's a, it's an old show. Yeah, and uh, so here's the thing. I was watching it, and I saw this character Super Grover on there. All right, he's a superhero. Flies around. He's got a helmet and cape. Yeah, I I think I remember that from when I was a kid. Uh, yeah, no, I I think I know what you're talking about. Well, that that's good, cause here's the thing. This is gonna blow your mind. I think that Super Grover may actually just be Grover. Are you are you kidding? I'm not kidding. This is very serious. Now here's the thing. You have got a a blue furry creature with superpowers out there, and no one's doing anything about it. Well, I I believe Sesame Street is a it's a TV show. It it's not real. Then why are there real people on it, Sam? Real people are on that show. It's a real show. We all know it. You know, Elmo testified in front of the Supreme, in front of Congress, in front of the Senate. I am aware of that. Uh, not my proudest moment in our country's history. But uh, y- you have to realize, Super Grover is, is fictional. That's just what they want you to believe. You have fallen for their lies, Sam. Now, here's the thing. I think that Super Grover may have actually been the one that took down the fourth flight on 9-11 in that Pennsylvania field. Uh, Mr. Mister Zones, that's that's really not appropriate. You don't have the a basis to make that claim. Come on. Nope, Sam, I might not have any basis, but I can say it. And people will listen to me because I've got a silky smooth voice and a really nice accent that's easy to place. Well, I, uh... I can't disagree with any of that because you won't come back. But, uh, Mr. Zones, I I really don't think you understand. Sesame Street is fictional. That, Sam, that you have fallen for the Democrat lie once again. I don't think that that politics has anything to do with it. I think that Sesame Street is a a show with puppets. No, the only puppet here is is the government, all right? That's the only puppet being run by the shadow government. That's the only one. All right, Mr. Zones, I don't think this is going anywhere. Uh, thank you for trying to tell me that Super Grover was Grover. I don't think that was a, a top secret thing, but I appreciate your effort. I, I appreciate your trying. Well, hey, thanks for having me on, Sam. And, uh, hey, watch out for the chemicals in that water, all right? It turns the freaking frog. All right, we had to cut off Mr. Zones there before he said something wrong. Uh, anyway, uh, the thank you very much to Mr. Zones for coming on the program and trying to make sense of uh, Sesame Street. <laughs> uh, but uh, now it's time for our commercial. Uh, so I will cut to commercial right now. Hi, my name is Sam, and I'm the host of A Bit Too Much to Think, live on KUST Radio. I might not have any sponsors, which is why I'm reading my own commercial for my own show. So if you are out there and you're a beer company and you'd like to sponsor someone, please consider sponsoring A Bit Too Much to Think, live on KUST Radio. Hams, I'm talking to you. I drink your beer way too much, and I'd love to have more of it and talk all about it on air. Coors need not apply. All right, we are back with... A bit too much to think live on KUST Radio. So the next portion of the show, uh, we're in the final 15 minutes. All right, it's the final countdown. I wish I had that song queued up so I could play it. But uh, I want to talk about some wholesome news briefly because the world is just too sad right now. And I want to talk about something that's a little happier. So I'm talking about some wholesome news. So the most wholesome news that I could find for this week, uh, I got it from the BBC. Um, It is that... uh, they're, so basically, they announced the winner for Alaska's Fat Bear Week contest, where basically uh, Alaska's Katmai National Park and Preserve uh, has a competition uh, to kind of to, to test how fat a bear can get over Fat Bear Week. And this is just, this, this brought a twinkle to my eye and a smile in my heart. 
Uh, there's pictures of so the brown bears. the The grizzly's name is Bead Nose, uh, and it shows pictures of Bead Nose in June, looking all thin and lithe, and uh, and her name. Yeah, okay. Her name is four oh nine B Bead Nose apparently, but uh, and then it shows a picture of her just looking really fat. And it just it brought a smile to my eye. That that's, oh gosh, it's so funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so literally they hold a fat bear competition. I don't know how they really measure it, uh, but the the reason for it is uh, the bears are gaining weight to to get ready for hibernation. Which makes sense, because it's Alaska. Uh, and although I want to live there, I don't know why anyone would. But, uh, yeah, so there's a, they have Fat Bear Week in Alaska. So that's a little bit of wholesome news. I hope it brings a smile to your to your face. Uh, so the, uh, the very last part of the show... Uh, actually, you know what? I got time. I'm going to play one more song. Uh, this song I'm very excited to play, because it's one of my absolute favorites. It is Pinball Wizard by The Who. Hi, this is Sam with a bit too much to think. Unfortunately, due to copyright reasons, we cannot upload the music to YouTube. So if you'd like to listen to it and get the full experience, listen to us live 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. on Fridays on Radio KUST on MixLR. That's MixLR.com slash KUST dash radio. Thanks for listening. All right, welcome back. That was Pinball Wizard by The Who, the story of the deaf, dumb, and blind kid that sure played a mean pinball. It says in the song that he plays by sense of smell. I have no idea how one would do that, but uh, it is a very interesting concept and something that I have always loved. So uh, I decided to play it because it is a classic song, and The Who are a classic band. All right, so this is the time where I like to give a closing idea a little bit more food for thought than the stuff I've already talked your ear off about. And this is, so if you're not familiar with, uh, I believe his name is John Rawls, R-A-W-L-S. You should look him up. He's basically one of the more important uh, political scientists of our time. And he wrote this book, Justice is Fairness, in which he tries to decide and figure out what would be the most just way to run a society? And he argues that justness, you know, for it to be just, it would basically have to be fair. And that's the the primary idea behind it. And so he, he writes about this concept that's very interesting to me, where he says that there's, uh, you know, if you were to take every single person in society and you were to put them be behind he calls it his veil of ignorance the veil of ignorance so if you're to put them behind a thing where they have no idea what they would what their life lives would be uh in this society they have no idea what class they would be in so you know you go into it completely blind into the society what would people be able to agree on that the society should look like and he argues that it should be as fair as possible meaning that the people with more are able to should help and should be mandated to help the people with less. And so the the idea is kind of like this, and this is how it was actually explained to me by my poli sci prof. Uh, That's probably a year ago now. Uh, but yeah, so he um, said that basically, so uh, as an example, LeBron James is very rich because we really value people who have a very good ability to take a basketball and put it through a hoop. And when you really think about it, that ability seems arbitrary, right? But we pay him a lot because he's really good at it. And don't get me wrong, like he he worked really hard at being good at it. But some level of it is is genetic. And some of it is opportunity. You know, a lot of kids, you know, if, if he had to work during high school and had to quit basketball, he might not have gotten to the level that he's at. So, you know, this is kind of the idea of he was in the he had the right opportunity, he was in the right spot, and he got really rich off of it. Off of something that seems arbitrary when you really think about it. And so this is this is kind of the idea is that, you know, he was really 
he w- was very benefit, you know, very much benefited. Now imagine a person who's really good. <laughs> this actually reminds me of an episode of Brooklyn Nine Nine I just watched, but a, a professional musician who's really good at playing the oboe. They don't have a lot because playing the oboe isn't as valued as playing basketball in terms of a monetary sense. Don't get me wrong, the arts are important, but let's be honest, like, if a person could play the oboe and make as much money as LeBron James, we'd have a million oboists. So, uh, the idea is that it's fair for some level of sharing to be brought around. Now, it's not like a socialist society that he argues is the most just. It's this idea of the people with more help the people with less because there's an element of luck involved, almost. And there's a lot more that goes into Rawls's idea of justice as fairness. Please read the book. It's actually very good for political thought. Uh, but that's kind of the idea is that, I, that I want to present to you is what does a just society look like to you? Is it everyone having equal opportunity? Or is it the people that have been benefited the most helping those that haven't been benefited by society? Or is it somewhere in the middle? I think personally, uh, it should be, you know, a quality of opportunity is the most important. But I also think that it's incumbent on a personal level of people with more to help the people with less. But you can't governmentally mandate that because that should be a private decision that a person makes. And who they help, I think, is up to the individual, too. Though you should help everyone. I mean, obviously, if every time you try to give someone money to help them, they spend it on lotto tickets, maybe that money isn't as deserved. But, you know, that's that's more of a uh, a personal decision that a person has. So that's my opinion on it. That's just kind of my two cents. But I want you to think about that as the week goes on. Think about what is the just and most... Is justice really fairness to you? What does the most just society look like to you? And I think that brings about questions of the purpose of government. Is the purpose of government to really have the most just society or is the purpose of government something else maybe the purpose of government is more to protect people you know it's something i'm going to talk about next week with uh another um political scientist that wrote a book almost in response as kind of a libertarian response to rawls but uh that's for next week so for this week think about it what is the purpose of government what is a just what is justice in a society to you And what would the ideal society look like? Just think about it. I think it's a very interesting thing to think. And it really makes you justify what your political opinions are. Because you might say, oh, well, you know, a just society is where everyone has everything equally. But then you realize you don't give anything to charity. Hmm. Maybe you should. All right. So uh, I'm going to close today with another one of my favorite songs. This is actually my walk-up song in high school baseball, because I'm cool. Uh, Vertigo by U2. Thank you very much to everyone for listening, by the way. Uh, I hope you'll tune in next week, 5.30 p.m., same bat time, same bat channel. Thank you very much, and take it away, U2. Hi, this is Sam with a bit too much to think. Unfortunately, due to copyright reasons, we cannot upload the music to YouTube. So if you'd like to listen to it and get the full experience, listen to us live 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. on Fridays on Radio KUST on MixLR. That's MixLR.com slash KUST radio. Thanks for listening.